So, they, so the knowing creation of such diversity within the spectrum of, of um, Pokemon, within, the, within this encyclopedic spread of Pokemon, plays into the core theme of Pokemon, communication or sushin. Okay? And this is any Wunderkammer with a huge diversity of objects, um, or the, the tiles with all the different animals and stuff like that. By having a variation, a willing variation in quality, they invite the big conversation between players to scrutinize and work through the new Pokemon as they are released as part of successive games. So part of the Baroque invitation, the eliciting of, of um, investment, uh, is predicated on a, on a willing control of quality and a willful let, uh, creation of a variable landscape, landscape of quality where you have um, what Pierce would call the kind of lexical, iconic, sort of perfect Pokemon, but then characters like Mr. Mime who are kind of anomalies. And in that sense, they create an ecology with a varied quality that enables users and players and so on to fully inhabit that space. Okay, so I'm going to talk about these guys. <laughs> so, so cool. So, beyond the still image, gesture and animation, and this, I, my, my feeling is, and it's something that Angela says, so I'm kind of paraphrasing her, but there's, a, there's always a kinetic quality to the, to the Neo Baroque. So, beyond the still image, gesture and animation play an integral role in Pokemon and its ante antecedent Pulse Man. Reviews of Pulse Man collectively say that the game feels fast and very solid and responsive. When you look at how the game is put together and pay particular attention to the character and environment on screen, certain qualities are apparent. There is a conscientious use of what I call keys. Okay? And by using the term keys, I'm following from a, from, I'm using a production word. And it kind of connects to what Walter was saying about you know, what Heidegger does, using these everyday terms. I'm trying to use that, this term keys. So animator Richard Williams rhetorically asks, what is a key? And then the answer is a storytelling drawing. The drawing or drawings that show what is happening in the shot. As Pulseman, as Pulseman falls through the air, we are given a pose that conveys something of his personality, his motivation, maybe even his agenda. When we see him gesture just before the title screen explodes, we are, gov we are given another little snippet. Sugumori's use of keys enables him to encapsulate story information in the design of the character and in so doing transcend with the design the conundrum of how best to convey a narrative in video game design. So my argument is in these designs um, the, bar the baroque ambiguity of Haranobu's ukiyo-e prints is maintained in that they contain the, the, the rikyu tension between stillness and movement, between pose and counterpose. Okay? and that it evolves over time. So, this has led me to kind of develop three terms with which to break up the kind of the visual field of um, Japanese Rikyu, the Japanese Baroque phenomena. So, accompanying silhouette and Hetauma, the key is crucial to appreciating the richness of Sugimori's 151 initial Pokemon designs. As both concept artist and animator, Sugimori has a complex appreciation for the key drawing, the gesture drawing. And, of all the and, and all the designs are keys in that they contain the basic orthographic information about the character. And in design, an orthographic drawing is the, is the drawing that gives you the exact proportion, like the Vitruvian man. It's the, it's, it's the limit case. Okay? So it contains the orthographic information, the rudiments of its appearance, while at the same time giving an, an impression of their personality and demeanour. This is something that distinguishes the sort of Baroque painting and the Renaissance and so on in the sense that even though when, even when you have serialized forms like cherubs and so on, the, the attention to the gestural dimension of their depiction individuates them to some degree. So you get this kind of variation within a serialized forms, what Andrew again has argued. So when you look across all the 151 designs, there are three emergent categories of pose which subtly determine the story and how it's, and how it's evoked. These categories are useful in, the, in that they help us to gauge the changing meaning of Pokemon as they evolve. So in Pokemon, you have a little character like this. As you play and you train it and you take it for walks and you make it have fights and you feed it its dinner and you do all that kind of stuff, eventually it grows older and it transforms from that into that in, this, in the case of Oddish. Oddish gets to a certain age and then he wants to get bigger, so he 
he kind of like, in a flash of light, he then becomes vinyl blue. Okay. okay. So, I'm really interested in these, oh, I'm really interested in these designs, okay? I'm thinking about um, across Pokemon, most Pokemon evolve in three stages. So if you look here, we've got Bulbasaur, Ivysaur, and Venusaur. That's three stages of the same Pokemon, three stages of evolution. Yeah, cool, okay. And then there's Charmander, Charmeleon, and Charizard, their three stages, and then Squirtle, Wartortle, and Blastoise, their three stages. So what I've done is analyze these three stages to look at how they articulate something of the Riku, something of the Japanese near baroque When you look at the first Pokemon, so Bulbasaur, uh, Charmander, and uh, Squirtle, so that's number one, number four, and number seven, okay. We can interpret this first stage as the toy stage, and you might compare it to a cuddly toy or a toy dog. The vast majority of Pokémon that have three stages of evolution see their first stage in this pose. The toy stage emphasizes irresistible cuteness and the status of the Pokémon as object. The ratio of head to body is usually equal, and the short arms or legs are outstretched, outstretched as if stuffed. In this stage, the pupils of the Pokémon's eyes are often widely dilated to maximize cuteness, and its gaze is ubiquitous. It strongly connotes a to-be-looked-at-ness, and also a to-be-held-ness, emphasized by the lack of orientation in the movement of the design. It sits as an object, subject to our merciful attentions. It recalls the Willem Dorfinus, an ancient fetish sculpture, optimized to fit into an owner's hand. In its vulnerability and lack of orientation, for instance, as conveyed by crossed eyes, it strongly connotes an unseen owner. In the bipedal upright Pokémon's, in, in the bipedal upright Pokémon, arms are often outstretched as if to gesture for an inv uh, in the invitation of a hug. Teetering forward, the arms also evoke the image of a baby taking its first steps. The original three, Bulbasaur, Charmander, and Squirtle, are what I would categorise as classic toy Pokémon. So the second category, so Ivy, the, the next stage along in the evolution, are designs uh, which I refer to as being in repose. In this second category, which usually refers to Pokemon which are in their second stage of evolution, but which can also include certain younger and older Pokemon, the character has grown larger and so the limbs are subtly posed. Yet, as in the bodies of adolescence, these characters contain either a frigid elegance or an awkwardness. In aesthetic terms, they are reminiscent of the Odalisk archetype in Orientalist art, the languid house servants who return our gaze over a naked shoulder. The eyes of repose Pokémon are smaller and more focused, and often address us directly, though their bodily gestures betray the vestiges of immaturity or quirkiness. The recurrent visual elements of the Pokémon in repose recall the ambiguity evoked by the fringe of Tezuka's rock archetype. 